Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Mental Health TV. We're so pleased to have you here tonight with a fantastic guest. Um, before we get started, though, I will hand you over to Vanessa and she can tell you about how you can join in tonight because we really want to hear from you. Any questions, any points that you want to make? All right, Vanessa. Thank you, Nikki. So um, if you're watching um, on Facebook, you'll know that um, you there will be a comments box for you to put any comments or questions as we go along. And I'll be keeping an eye on those and feeding those questions into the conversation. If you um, haven't joined us before, you just need to head over to the Facebook Unite MHNA page, like the page, and then the live feed should appear on your Facebook if you want to join in on Twitter instead, just follow the hashtag MHTV and you'll see the conversation there. And again, ask us any questions. We like to have discussion. Um, Natasha is here to answer any questions and, um, and we look forward to hearing from you. So I'll hand you back over to Nikki. Okay then. So let's get started. Natasha, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about my job because... Yeah. Um, it's a made up job. So <laughs> I, I go into about three schools or colleges a week. And before the pandemic that involved traveling there, but now I do it virtually. And my job is in two parts, really. I, I deliver talks on mental health and related issues like uh, body image and gender. But I also do research with teenagers, with 13 to 18 year olds. And the aim of the research is to try and find out what their day-to-day -day mental health challenges are. Because I feel like mm -hmm. there's, there's three layers to the mental health conversation. There's the universal mental health, the basic maintenance, the things that we can all do to look after our brain. And then there's diagnosable mental health issues and mm -hmm. mental illness. But mm -hmm. there's this middle layer, which are the mental health challenges that are universal. I guess the mental health equivalents of um, colds and sickness bugs and stuff. So what I'm trying to do is find out what those are, um, get co coping tools for those things to young people with the help of experts. Mm. And in doing so, hopefully universalize the conversation about mental health so that if any of them do struggle in the future, they already have some ideas about for example, how they react to stress and anxiety and, and what normal is like for them. Yeah. That's brilliant. And we've, we've, well, we've got loads of things we want to talk about, just so that people know the sorts of areas we're going to be going we've about. Um, the fact we've just had Children and Young People's Mental Health Week. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the, the well-being of younger people. Um, but I think one of the things that you're working on at the minute is, is a combination of lockdown scepticism and mental health. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that, because that is, I think that's going to be something that the audience is going to want to get involved in. So I have a, a campaign called the Mental Health Media Charter. And mm -hmm. as the name would suggest, we're there to scrutinize the way that mental health is discussed in media so that it's um, responsible and doesn't perpetuate unhelpful stereotypes. And something that I'd noticed was that for the lockdown skeptics, and, and to be clear about that, I don't mean people who have naturally concluded that they would rather not be in lockdown than be in. I mean, people who have a political ideology that yeah. we shouldn't be in lockdown because money is more important than health and will literally throw anything at that <laughs> to make it happen. Mm -hmm. They suddenly discovered this passionate concern for mental health. And, and these are people who had voted for, for example, the millions and millions of pounds of cuts to children and adolescent mental health services, um, overseen so many policies which damaged mental health in the past. And then they suddenly went, this is a problem now because we don't want lockdowns to happen. Mm. And as much as lockdown is not fun, and for a lot of people it has exacerbated their mental health issues, it's caused a lot of mental health issues, to suggest that everybody who's struggling with their mental health is anti-lockdown is... Mm not true mm. and it's also appropriating our voices for a, a, a political ideology and I thought I'm not having it so um, I composed this this open letter which was just guidance to media where I was saying to them look if somebody just says mental health there's so many things that that could potentially mean and this is how you can question them on it and and ask them who they speak for and just don't let them get away with making these generalizations mm. and then it was signed by lots of academics, experts, 
and charities, but also um, by service users as well, just to say these people don't speak for us. Mm. Is there anything that people watching could do? Or is, or is this a, a project that's nearing its completion now? What, what? That you can still sign the open letter either on behalf of yourself or an organisation if you work for one. Just um, You can read the letter on the Mental Health Media Charter page of my website mm -hmm. and just drop me a line, get in touch and, and say if you want to sign it. Yeah, we'll definitely tweet that out as well so that people yeah, can, can, yeah, can see yeah. them. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I guess another thing that's sort of current at a minute, we've just had like an awareness week. We've just got the um, appointment of an ambassador. I wondered if you've got any thoughts on that, because those are both things that really relate to the work that you've done and are doing. Yes, I have a lot of feelings about this. <laughs> I, had, I had a lot of feelings last week because, mm. as as you probably know, I mm. was the, the mental health champion for schools. Yeah. Uh, appointed in 2015, mm -hmm. backed in 2016 for being mm -hmm. publicly critical of austerity and education policy. Mm. And they did to say... Your, to your credit, I might say. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But they did say when they fired me that we're looking to appoint someone else, and mm -hmm. it, it's taken them five years. So as part of me that was expecting it, and I think Dr. Alex is a more honest choice because I, I think what the government always wanted was somebody who was popular with young people and an influencer and who would keep the conversation quite light. Um, I think what concerns me is nothing to do with, with him. I'm sure he's a great guy. He's also a GP, so he has some, some basic knowledge. Mm. But the fact that having read the, the first couple of articles he's written, he's mm. talking about universal mental health and, and resilience and mental fitness. I saw a video where he was talking about that with Boris Johnson and Boris Johnson was like, nobody's ever said that before. You've invented this idea of universal mental health. And I thought, like, how many times are the government going to get away <laughs> yeah. with going, we've just realised that children and young people's mental health is an issue and we're going to take action. And, you know, was there another one five years before me? And, and I just didn't know. And, mm. and uh, you know, this sounds really egotistical. And honestly, I don't mean it in that way. But not one of the media pieces on Dr. Alex's appointment mentioned me. Mm. I thought, well, it's true. The government have, a, um, the, the media rather, have a very, very short memory. Mm. So the government can get away with going, look at this action that we're taking. Look mm. at this progress that we're making. When in reality, mm. so little has happened in those mm. five years. Mm. It's sort of gone round in a circle, hasn't it, as well? It's not, it's not even that it's happening and it's progressing. It's just that we're still back where we are. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult thing, isn't it? So, I mean, on one hand, it's a really great thing to have somebody who's a spokesperson. But when you look at the, the issues that we have with children and young people's health, it does feel like quite a lot to put on any one person. Well, also, is, is how are we defining mental health? Are, are mm. we talking about coping tools to help young people through this particularly difficult time, which seems to, to be yeah. the gist? Or are we talking about young people who are on a waiting list for therapeutic care uh, with severe mental illness? Because mm. you know, that, that investment of 1.5 billion in mm. 2015, which is peanuts in the scheme of things, that was meant to have been invested by 2020, and it still hasn't been. And mm. even the the proportion of it that has mm. been invested wasn't ring fenced. So, in I think Luciana Berger did a, a an investigation where she found yeah. that in 50 percent of cases, the local health authorities were spending that money meant for for mental health on other priorities. So it's not reaching the people who need it on the ground. So there's, there's a big, big gap, I think, between the rhetoric around mental health and the, yep. the reality. Very yeah. much so. Very much so. Now, if you do want to dive in, Vanessa, do, by the way. Yeah, no, I was just, yeah, I totally agree with you. Everything you've just it. said, as <laughs> Nikki would know, is absolutely music to my ears and something that I bang on about all the time. And it's very kind of convenient, isn't it, to focus on mental health um, at primary care level, because that assumes that we're talking about mild to moderate mental illness and that people get better and they go back to leading their productive lives in their high powered jobs. But the reality is that, you know, we, we then don't address anything about social justice. We don't address inequality and we don't talk about people with severe mental illness, as you've just said, who mm. are never going to recover and who recovery means something entirely different. 
So I, you know, support what you're saying 100 percent and it's great to hear mm. from here tonight. And I hope that people listening will join in the conversation, too, because I'm sure there's a lot of support out there for what you're saying. Yeah, I'm so awesome. glad that you said that about social justice, because mm. people don't believe me when I say this. But when I first started doing this job and it'll be 13 years in September that I've been going into schools doing this, mm. I was sublimely apolitical. I hadn't even voted for which there's no excuse. Uh, but I just didn't think that politics was relevant mm. to mm. people's everyday lives. Yeah. And then the more I spoke to people and their families and traveled around mm. the country, the more I started seeing patterns and thinking, wow, mental illness is really disproportionately affecting those for whom society mm. is not working. Uh, therefore, I have to take an interest in social justice mm. if I want to legitimately have an interest in mental health. Yeah. And then people always say, oh, don't make it political. I'm mm. like, but it is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it Fundamentally is. is. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Completely. Yeah. yeah. And where do you stand on the kind of awareness week? Then we've talked a little bit about ambassadors and their sort of role. How do you feel about the kind of like channeling everything, throwing everything at one week kind of way of going about? I mean, it's it's difficult. I like the fact that the weeks and the days are themed. So at mm. least in, in theory, you're highlighting one aspect because, you know, we'd never have a physical health awareness day <laughs> and, and try and cover everything that, that, mm. that could possibly encapsulate. So I, I like that at least the discussion is meant to be centred around something. Mm. And I do find that still the... the the space in media for these things to be discussed is finite. And mm. it's about making the best possible use of that. Because you, you'll find, you, you know, you talk, if you say you want to talk about um, suicide awareness um, for, I don't know, retirement aged men. Mm. If you, you can go to a, to a media company and they'll say, oh, we've, we've done that. We've covered that. And you think, oh, we've sold it then, have we? Great. But it's, what did they cover it in the right way? Because there, there's awareness raising, which is great, but yeah. then you also need to give people links to signpost to services, give people hope that there is support out there, and also mm. lobby for the support that's needed for people. Mm, definitely, mm. definitely. And one of the things I was really curious about, um, not least because I have to say I found camps terrifying. <laughs> one place I was like, mm, get me out. You, you, you've, you've chosen to work with young people, with teenagers particularly. What, what led you into that? What, what, what brought you down that road? Um, I love teenagers. Yeah, they're, me too. I do find them scary, but I do love them. I did it first as well. And then I realised that it, teenagers have a really finely tuned inauthenticity detector. Oh, God, yeah. So oh, yeah. As soon as you're not being real with them or you're not being yourself, that's when they turn on you. But as long as you, you know, they don't expect you to know all of the, mm. the slang terms that they would use mm. or what happens on TikTok or, you know, it's fine. Mm. As long as you have the humility to go, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> I've got to tell you what I know. I don't know what that is. Mm. Um, and I, so I think it, for me, it's appealing because from a neurological perspective, your teenage years are an opportunity to rewire some of the things mm. that you picked up in childhood. Mm. And it's um, a time in their life where they're, they're sort of old enough to understand how the world works, but they're open-minded enough to want it to change. Yeah. And some of the mm. questions that they ask you... I was going to ask about that. You never know what they're <laughs> with. You ne you're never bored. But what, what, are they pre what are they preoccupied about? What are the, what are the big issues from their perspective? Because we hear a lot of stuff about what's wrong with the children's mental health from people who have been not teenagers for a very long time. So what are, what are, what are younger people saying when you're, when you're working with them? So for them... A lot of it is about academic pressure mm. and how the school system in of itself doesn't allow breathing space for um, any kind of well-being. Mm. So that they almost feel like that their mental health self-care is another thing on an already too full to-do list. Yeah. And, and a lot of them have bought into this idea that they have to choose between looking after their mental health and excelling academically, which is something mm. I, I work very hard to try and yeah. disabuse them of. So that that's where they tend, generally tend to go with the conversation. What, what's really mm. interesting to me is the discrepancy between the impact they think social media is having on them and then the impact that their parents and teachers perceive it to be having. 
there's a huge gulf between those two things. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think the truth is probably somewhere in between. I don't think they're best placed to assess the impact that it's having on them. Mm. Sometimes parents can be a little bit too worried. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but I really have to, I think it's really important that we talk about social media and technology with them, but I have to tread so carefully with it because mm. I think it's become like the new sex education. You know, we all had that sex ed teacher that was like, just be celibate. And we were like, mm. um, so, so if you... I watched a very bewildering apology. video that seemed to be mostly about netball. I was really? terrified. <laughs> what the hell is this? It's funny. <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, if you <laughs> demonize anything, they're, they're, yeah, they're going to switch off. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's that middle ground thing. Mm. So also, yeah, it's what's the well. it's, it's, I was going to say it's important to get into that space where they are as well, because I've got a teenage boy and, um, you know, just this week he got a really inappropriate um, request um, from, um, you know, from a man pro- who was very mm. predatory, basically. Um, and straight away, my son told me about it. I mean, he'd already blocked him and reported him by the time he told me. But um, for me, it was just the fact that he told me and that we had an honest conversation. So I think it's, you know, a lot about knowing what children are doing online and making sure that they have somebody that they can talk to. Because for a vulnerable child, you know, it could have been a completely different outcome. I quite like the fact that you've already taken care of it before you informed you of it. I know, I love like, that. Figured yeah, this I've guy out, blocked him, reported him. Mom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really praised him for that. But, you know, it does make me think, it does worry me, you know, how many mm. children are getting these messages, how many young people at the moment. So mm. I think it's um, a growing area of concern for us, really. Mm. I think for me, I did some some work when I was working with um, between sort of th- 10 to 13 year olds. And so many of the questions were about being asked to send pictures they weren't comfortable with. Mm-hmm. Or else was saying, you know, how do I get a really good shot? And I'm like, that, that's not my job to tell you that. <laughs> but but they, they didn't have a clue about the law. They didn't have the, the clue that passing that stuff is basically child yeah. pornography. They didn't have any understanding. They didn't think about it that way at all, which is not surprising because you don't necessarily. I, I tried to create discussions with them about mm. um, lengthening the space between urge and action. Mm-hmm. And, and that's actually an idea that I got from a teacher who said to me, we were talking about the, the pressure to, to send those kinds of, of, mm. of images. And she was saying, that, well, in my day, you had to take it on a camera and take it to, to Boots and have it developed. And then by the time the pictures came back, you would thought the better of it. And mm-hmm. I thought that's genius. It's the instantaneousness of it. Yeah. So yeah. I, I came up with this kind of five questions you should ask yourself before pressing the send button, just to try and mm. create that moment of stillness where they can think, do I really want to do this? Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's, is, that, is that on your website as well, Natasha, if people want to find that? It's uh, that, those five questions aren't on my website, but it is in my uh, book, first book plug. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah we need to We will be tweeting that out too, don't we'll worry. Don't sharing worry. the link. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting questions through here, Vanessa. Did you want to to ask them? Yeah. Um, we've got one from um, Adrian Jugdoyle who has put, how can someone who is self-declared as old, um, me too, how can, we incorporate, <laughs> how can we incorporate mental health well-being to other parts of a young person's life? I'm not actually sure what he's driving at there. Um. So I, is it about how do you have the discussion across the generations? Yeah, yeah, that's um, it, isn't it? So I, I always find that if if there's somebody who's different from you in any regard, um, the, the golden rule is always listen with the intent of understanding. So so I, I always say to parents and teachers, look, your idea of what anxiety is, your idea of what depression is, will be different from a young person's. So if they are saying, if they're using these words, don't assume that you know what they mean. Ask them, okay, what does that feel like? How long have you felt this way? What does it stop you doing? What makes it better or worse? And that makes them feel that you have a genuine interest in them. It makes them feel safe and and non-judged which is really important, but it also gives you a better understanding of what that young person needs because I, I feel like there's 
this tendency to go, oh, anxiety, waiting list, cams, <laughs> kind of thing. And, and sometimes what the young person needs is, is much simpler than that mm. or, or not within the remit of CAMS. And, and it's useful to, to find out as much as you can in the first instance. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I've got some student ones here coming through on the WhatsApp. Uh, one question, what's the oddest question you've been asked in a school session? <laughs> um, I, I was once asked if I was a biscuit, what sort of biscuit would I be? Ooh, what um, sort of biscuit would you be? I, do you know what? I, I change my mind about this all the time. So I said, <laughs> uh, like, um, <laughs> I said on the spur of the moment, a ginger nut, because mm. I've got reddish hair and mm. I'm sort of quite robust. Mm. <laughs> so that's like, yeah, 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 that was that was the answer I came up with. But it, it depends on the day, I think. But yeah, I got asked that. I quite often get asked, uh, where do you get your shoes from? And um, things like that. I think the best question that I've ever been asked was um, somebody said, do you think that there's a legitimate argument that antidepressants are just um, anaesthetizing people against society's injustices? And I was like, wow, wow you just said a <laughs> mouthful there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and did you? I, well, I said that there is absolutely a legitimate argument there. I, I mean, when it comes to antidepressants, I, I, you have to tread so carefully because yeah. people tend to either think that that you know that there's too much stigma around them, which there is, or that they're a massive government conspiracy to you know to keep us all compliant. And and actually, the truth is that they work really well for some people. They're life saving for some people. Mm -hmm. They make some people worse, and mm -hmm. for a lot of people, they're unnecessary. Mm -hmm. But they're on them anyway, um, mm -hmm. and you you don't want to alienate any of of those mm -hmm. groups. So um, I, I always approach those kinds of conversations with a, a little bit of trepidation. But um, I yeah, I mean, I think that there's a, an absolutely solid foundation to the question that was asked. Yeah, okay, I've got a couple more. One is um, I'm qualifying next year. What do I need to do? Uh, I'm going to want to work in cams. What do I need to do to be good at it? Big wow. question. <laughs> that's a that's a massive question. Yeah, congratulations um, for qualifying next year. Just hang on in there. It's going to be a yeah. rough ride, but you'll get there. Yeah. yeah. First, yeah. First of all, congratulations. I think mm. um, the thing I hear most often from young people about their experience of CAMS is that they feel that they're ping ponging between different service providers because there's no joined up thinking. So, if, for example, they have a mood disorder and autism or substance abuse and depression. They feel like nobody wants to take responsibility for them. Mm. They're being kind of pushed from pillar to post mm. or that there's just no consistency in, in mm. kind of the care that they receive. So um, I would say, you know, my, my top tip would be to, to try and join, join up the thinking and create a consistent team around that person so that they feel kind of scooped up and, and nurtured mm. and supported. Mm. Mm. And the last one I've got here. I, I remember you from when I was at school. It's nice. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> when I was at school, um, been amazing watching you. What are you going to do next? <laughs> Feels like um, yeah. that you're about to do something like a performance. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to um, sing tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, tonight, Matthew. Um, I what am I going to do next? That's a really good question. So um, I just six six months ago I got given my own weekly show on LBC, um, which is amazing. Like I just love it so much, and mm. I love that because it's almost a, a kind of microcosm of of what I do in schools, but with mm. all different age people because it's. Mm getting a flavor of what's going on, on on the ground with people and and kind of relating it to the the big narratives mm. in current affairs mm. so I, I very much hope that I'll, I'll be there for the long haul um, mm. I've also I I am um, I wrote a, a young adult novel last year mm -hmm. um, about toxic friendships because that was the thing that young people told me was really missing from their sex and relationships education mm. Mm. they they really needed some help um navigating that. Mm. Um, and I'm also this year writing a book for teenagers about the internet. I have 35,000 words to summarize everything about the internet. <laughs> How's that going? <laughs> the more people I interview, the more I'm like, I, I couldn't do this if I had 10 books <laughs> to mm. do it in. There's just so much to say. But mm. yeah. <laughs> well, that sounds like a brilliant, brilliant career. 
thanks. Really? No, but do you know what I mean? Like, because you, you made it. Nobody gave it to you. And that's that, I think, is something that's going to be more and more and more happening in mental health. You know, the, the really interesting, exciting, cutting-edge stuff is happening not necessarily in mainstream services now. And it's really important for, for maybe for student nurses, when we're talking to student nurses, um, for, to see that, to see that you've got lots of different options. You yeah. can do anything now. And it's, I heard the other day this quote that if you play your life backwards, it makes sense. <laughs> and because um, I have so many young people going, I'd really love to do something similar to what you do. What advice would you give me? And, and there's mm. not really an established career path, but... I've, you know, I worked a little bit in the fashion industry. I, I got myself a diploma in law um, and then realized mm. law was really boring. Um, and, <laughs> you know, and I've worked in, in all of these different kind of industries, which, and media, of course, which mm. really play into to mental health and, and what I'm doing now and are mm. really useful. But at the time, I couldn't have told you that it would have ended up in this path, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does make sense. Um, we've got mm. uh, a couple of questions coming in from Dave there. Dave, well. Yeah. Did you want to ask them? Shall I, Vanessa? All right, go ahead. It's fine. Uh, I don't want to be on your territory. That's all I'm no, saying. No, you're not. No, I'm, just, um, <laughs> I'm just madly putting, transcribing yeah. it all here. So we've got yeah. um, Natasha has spoken previously about uh, reclaiming the word mental. Do we need to reclaim the word woke as well? Yes. Mm. yes. Tell me about that. Absolutely right. I, I'm so I, I'm so fired up about this because mm. woke is um is a piece of African American slang. Mm. It's a positive thing. It means mm. literally that you are awake to the injustices in society, particularly yeah. racism, and that you see them and therefore you yeah. fight them and you challenge yeah. them. And honestly, these people who are positioning themselves as anti woke, I just think yeah. that they want the freedom to be racist or homophobic and not challenged on it, not called on it. Yeah. That's that's what it look like looks like to me. Mm. And all of the <laughs> I just feel like what happens is you get these outrage mongers mm. who will pick something that's sort of quite fringe but symptomatic of something that people are, are worried about. Yeah. They'll start gobbing off about it, which of course causes outrage. And then they say, see. The woke people, the left wing, they're just angry about everything. You can't say anything anymore. And, you know, this is the new fascism. And it and it's ridiculous. Mm. It, mm. And it's characterizing woke people as um, wanting to police behavior in language when, in fact, yeah. the opposite is true. What, what they're saying is our language and behaviors have been policed for so long, disadvantaging so many people. Let's mm. open it out <laughs> mm. um, to stop this from happening. So, mm. yes emphatically <laughs> and the next question is has natasha got any more podcasts planned with dr keon west so tell us about those podcasts and have you got any more i really hope so so uh, dr keon west is um he was my co-host on um, a show called naked beach um neither of us were naked at any point which was apparently quite disappointing um, <laughs> for some people miss selling um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and he's great he's amazing so um he works at goldsmiths university and he's a reader in social psychology and uh, a lot of his work is in body image but he also does a lot of work around racism as well and he just um did this talk this lecture which was so interesting about um the the dunning kruger effect mm. and how it plays out in racism so he was saying basically that the more racist you are the less you are able to see that you are racist which yeah. I, I think is, is really interesting mm, but yeah. we um we did this a podcast called Fact or Ball, which was um, <laughs> every week we a statement and then we invited an expert to discuss with us whether that statement was fact or ball. So mm. one was um, gender is a social construct, for example. Mm. And then at the end, mm. we have to vote, is that fact or is it ball? And mm. it's a real misnomer because every single week we went, it's neither fact nor ball. It's very nuanced <laughs> and it's somewhere in the middle. But um, <laughs> it, it was so good. And um, I really, I mean, obviously lockdowns made it really difficult, but I mm. really hope that we will be able to, to revisit it because it was so much fun and so interesting. Mm. Now, how is lockdown going for you? How are you managing um, I'm, I'm all right, actually. So I, I should say I'm, I'm incredibly privileged in so far as I, I don't have kids. Um, I have mm. a cat and a husband who are both quite independent and self-sufficient. 
no, nobody is is relying <laughs> on me for anything. Mm. Um, and I also live in an area where there's literally either side of me, there's parks um, where I can go and, and get fresh air and be in, be in nature. <clears throat> So from that point of view, I mean, I always think, what would I do if I was stuck at home with, you know, three kids under 10 in a flat in a high rise? Like, yeah. you know, I, I wouldn't cope in those circumstances. But um, for me, it's it's been um, it's been OK. I'm really glad that I've had mental illness in the past mm -hmm. and that I had therapy and I learned coping tools for anxiety and low mood because they have mm -hmm. come in so handy for surviving lockdown. Mm. Yeah, tell me about all that. That's a really interesting idea, isn't it? The most uh, yeah. survivor of the actually mentally fittest. <laughs> well, that, that's the thing is, uh, I know now when I'm spiraling into yeah. anxiety, I have a diagnosis of panic disorder, I should say. Mm. Um, and I know that the best form of defense is to catch it early mm -hmm. and to, to get in there. So one of my big coping mechanisms is exercise because um, I'm one of those fidgety, anxious people. It creates a lot of energy yeah. for me. So kind of getting it out through exercise mm. um, and and also um, writing down all of my worries is a big coping strategy for me. Um, mm. I take medication still mm. daily um, and a, and also separating out the, the paranoid thoughts and the, the catastrophizing thoughts from the gen, sort of genuine worries mm -hmm. is a skill that I've, I've picked up. And all of those I've employed yeah really yeah, um definitely. throughout lockdown yeah i think i'm with you on that one do you think people are talking about i mean it feels to me because i tune into those discussions that people are talking more about mental health and people are being a bit more open-minded a bit more maybe sympathetic and empathetic towards people that have had experiences of that kind maybe because we're all experiencing difficulties in ways perhaps we didn't before do you know that so the book that i wrote in in 2018 mm. um was about how we have to be more specific in a lot of ways when we mm. say mental health, because, mm. you know, if somebody's uh, got a, a huge amount of exam stress, that's absolutely a legitimate mental health issue, mm. but mm. it's not the same as a diagnosable anxiety mm. disorder. They're two different things that require two different responses. And mm. what I, I feel a bit like the, the conversation has been almost appropriated by people who, they're, they're worried and anxious and mm -hmm. they're, uh, you know, a little bit low mm. because they're paying attention because the world is a skip fire right now. And mm. they're talking a lot about their mental health, but I almost feel like people who have needs that only services can can provide have yeah. almost been squeezed out of the, mm -hmm. the conversation a little bit. Yeah, I think you might be onto something there. Yeah, mm. there is a lot of, me because I think people are getting mental health and mental distress mixed up a little bit yeah. and I have to say there's been a quietening should we say of a lot of kind of co-productive activities that's been put to the back again but when is it not in a time of trouble when is it not I think that's something we're going to need to um to look at going forward though and I, what I have liked is the kind of discussion of mental health becoming almost like public mental health now so what are we doing as societies and communities to just be better at this and, and, and in the past, we've always had that kind of, I won't say neoliberal, but the way of resilience being, why aren't you coping? And now we're like, no one can cope with this. Mm. You know, that you know. And, and for me, when we were talking about Children's Mental Health Week, what struck me most is, is bringing in an ambassador when you can't guarantee food for a kid. Yeah. I was really shocked by how closely those two things happened. And, and for me, I found that quite, quite disturbing that people don't necessarily join those dots up. Because, mm. you know, how do you, you tell a child that you care about its well-being and you care about its emotional state and its ability to live in the world if you can't feed it regularly or if you're scared that you're not going to have enough to eat? Or I find that stuff really mind-blowing. But the yeah. ambassador's not for those children, is it? It's for no. it's for middle-class children with Tory voting parents to, to try <laughs> and show, show that they care. I, I mean, I... I have two catchphrases I've realized on my LBC show because my producer <laughs> told me the other day. Um, one is, I think we're being too binary in our thinking about this. Um, and, the, and, the, uh, and the other one is... the middle, yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, the middle ground. Yes. Um, and the other one is, COVID has exacerbated problems that were already there. Yeah. 
Mm. And it's yeah. for me, I've seen that progressively over the past decade or more that mental health issues will disproportionately affect those people who society isn't serving. And mm. over the years, that's become larger and larger and larger and larger group, groups of people. And then you think, okay, so where's the tipping point then? Where, when do we go, okay, mm. this isn't working. We need, we need a different way of, of doing mm-hmm. things. Mm. So how do you think we could better support sort of children and young people? If we're going to do some things strategically, mm. uh, as a holistic way of looking at supporting children and young people, what should we, do you think we should be doing? Well, I think, first of all, that we need to focus less on the kind of talky education side of things and mm. more on the creating the environment where these are the habits that young people adopt so mm-hmm. so I think that for example about um nutrition it, it's like you can't you can't go into an area where the only food places around this school are chicken shops and then lecture them about obesity and yep. lowering sugar intake like what are you going to do to ensure that those children have access to healthy food and in the same way I feel like mm-hmm. there's there's a lot of emphasis on teaching children resilience by talking to them about it but at the same time, we've seen defunding of things like sports and arts, music, yeah. drama, and those have got a measurable positive impact. Yeah. The, the way a lot of young people express themselves emotionally, they're endorphin producing, they restore chemical balance. So it's, it's, yeah. it's almost about putting back in the mm. things that, that support mm. well-being. Mm. I think you're right. You're right. Vanessa, is there anything you wanted to add? Because I can see we're coming towards, we try and stop about 40 minutes. We're chronic chatters. If we don't limit ourselves, everybody's yeah. in for a long night. So <laughs> anything that you wanted to add, Vanessa, before we start think, to tie things um, up? What, what's just been talked about, really, and, and I think looking at it from a healthcare system point of view, it's mm. looking at the whole system, isn't it? So if we're saying that mental health should be focused on schools and in the community, we need to make sure that people who work in mental health in those places have skills to work with people who might present with really high levels of distress. Because Mm. what I found from the work I've been doing in the last year or so is that, you know, yes, CAMS has got a huge waiting list and people get get into CAMS. And I absolutely agree that CAMS might not be the best option and that Mm. it might be, you know, that it would be better for young people to be supported in schools. And Mm. I say that as a parent, as well as someone working in mental health, Um, But we need to make sure that the skills and the resources are right at those levels to work with people, because if we've only got people who've got sort of basic mental health skills, then we can't expect them to suddenly be able to work effectively, you know, with Mm. people with, um, you know, really high levels of distress, serious mental health difficulties and all the other issues that we've just talked about. So I'm not sure whether that's a question, but I guess interested <laughs> in your take on it as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what what I heard in your answer was that there, there are lots of different levels to mental health care. Yeah. And I think too often the temptation is to take one of those levels and see it as the silver bullet. Mm. And it, Theresa May introducing that policy where there would be a mental health first aider in every school. Yeah, I absolutely support that. But the job of a mental health first aider is to listen non-judgmentally, ask the right questions and signpost. Yeah. So if there's nowhere to signpost to, yeah. then yeah. That, that, exactly. that fundamentally falls apart. The same with mm-hmm. having a school count a school counsellor in every school. Um, school mm-hmm. counsellors are fantastic, but they can't serve the needs of every single child. So it's I think resisting the urge to go, this is the thing that's going to solve it, and actually having lots of different inter- interventions that build this kind of comprehensive safety net that that children can't slip through. Yeah, I agree. And, and I hear what you're saying that as well around um, some of the issues around food, for example, that, you know, we have a tendency to pathologise everything, don't we? But there's often other ways that you can work with children and help them. You know, um, certainly, you know, when I, I used to work on a mother and baby um, unit many years ago and some of the older siblings, um, you know, who used to be kind of hanging out on the unit, um, it was a mother and baby unit. So, um, you know, some of the older siblings would be hanging out and it was clear that they were hungry, um, but there were quite easy solutions sometimes around sort of breakfast clubs and kind of, you know, working working with the families to look at, you know, to look at 
feet, well, breakfast mainly. I mean, the one child in particular, I remember, was always raging the fridge as soon as he came in. And mm-hmm. the whole issue was that the mum was rushing to her appointment on a morning and there was no time for him to have any breakfast. And there's a tendency to kind of rush down the safeguarding route and a tendency to kind of assume that we need um you know, you know, a really sort of complex solution to things, but sometimes it can be something really practical, can't it, that can help people. Mm. I just looked down because a question came in. I thought, oh, and it yeah. was, it's it's not really a question so much as love Natasha, love that top, and then an emoticon with two love heart eyes. So <laughs> <laughs> We it's love you too. A, it's just a hoodie. Do they mean my top? They yeah. mean your top. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. some serious, serious hoodie love here with the love heart eyes. <laughs> well, I think that's a, quite a good place for us to start to round up then. But what I think before we go, if we had any sort of like final thoughts, maybe or anything that anyone wanted to say before we, we head off tonight. So Natasha, can I come to you? Well, I I mean, I would say that the enormity of what needs to be done can sometimes feel really overwhelming, but Mm. I wouldn't want anybody to go away from this talk today thinking, well, therefore what I do won't make a difference or doesn't matter. Mm. You know, so often it Mm. is just, it can be as little as something that someone said, you know, I I get people who I went into Mm. their school a decade ago and they go, I remember when you said this. And and so it really, those those small actions are are so valuable and and we do all make a difference every single day. Brilliant. Vanessa? No, I just think it's been great. And I think you're a great spokesperson for mental health. And I I love that you're talking about some of the inequalities and social justice and there aren't enough of those voices around. And I think it's really important. And, you know, as a parent, you know, of a teenager and a pre-teenager, I think, um, you know, the messages, uh, you know, totally resonate with me as a parent as well. So, yeah, thank you for coming on. It's been great. Absolutely. Absolute, yeah. absolute pleasure. What an amazing guest. Thank you so, so much, Tasha. Thanks. Really love that. And it just remains for us to say goodnight then, everyone. Good, Good night. night. Take care. Bye.